would like us also to remember that all the good work we do is no good if our contexts are not uh, conducive towards good student um, engagement and student living and learning. So while we work at our universities and we try and prove our spaces in the universities, we must remember our students are contextualized, they live in context, they live embedded lives together with their families, with their homes, with their and together with all the social ills that often that they need to live with. And we must remember that and that makes us social activists, it makes us um, activists towards creating a world and a context for our students in which they can, you know, really engage and be um, authentically part of focusing on their studies. So I want us just to remember also about uh, the context. Hello and welcome to Student Affairs Now. I'm your host, Keith Edwards. Today, we're discussing movements toward professionalization of student affairs across the globe. I'm joined by the editors of the New Directions book on this topic. They have gathered global student affairs and services leaders to explore movements towards professionalization, sharing their diverse perspectives, and looking toward the future. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and online learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find details about this episode or browse our archives at studentaffairsnow.com. Today's episode is sponsored by Leadershape. Go to leadershape.org to learn how they can work with you to create a just, caring, and thriving world. This episode is also sponsored by Rutledge and Taylor and Francis. View their complete catalog of authoritative educational titles at rutledge.com education. As I mentioned, I'm your host, Keith Edwards. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a speaker, author, and coach, helping leaders and organizations make transformations for leadership, learning, and equity. You can find out more about me at keithedwards.com. I am recording this in my home in Minneapolis, Minnesota, at the intersections of the ancestral homelands of both the Dakota and the Ojibwe peoples. So let's get to our conversation. Thank you both for being here and for joining me. Let's hear a little bit about each of you and Birgit, let's begin with you. Thank you for having us, Keith. It's I'm very excited to be here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm it's so good you modeled for me how to introduce yourself because I was trying to think, where exactly am I sitting? So I'm sitting physically in Germany, in the southern part of Germany, and we've just had snow in the mountains, so it's very mm -hmm. nice for skiing. But my professional life and most of my working life I've um, spent in southern Africa. So I've got a very big strong footprint in southern sub-Saharan Africa, where I've worked in senior leadership in high education institutions, mainly in student affairs. Mm -hmm. I teach there, I supervise PhDs, I'm affiliated and I, I do all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, but I have my cup of tea here in um, Germany, although, yeah, exactly. So, Yes, that. well, I'm mm -hmm. bright and early here this morning here in Minnesota and you're in the evening there, so wonderful. Lisa, let's learn a little bit about you. Sure. Well, I'm I'm at the I am in in Dubai, so it's it's later evening here, mm -hmm. and I'm Lisa Bardel Muscatolo. She, her, and hers pronouns, and I've been a senior leader in student affairs and higher education now for gosh twenty years, and then another fifteen in other roles. I'm in the process of transitioning a little from full-time administrative work and just serve as a professor for the School of Business and Information Technology at Purdue University Global. Mm -hmm. And I do serve as the Secretary General for IASIS. And that's kind of the connection between Birgit and I yeah. is the International Association of Student Affairs and Student Services. So I'm thrilled to be here too, Keith. Yeah. Well, thank you both for being here and engaging in the conversation today. And uh, you edited this New Directions book, which offers, as we talked about, sort of a conversation about professionalization, uh, which is super complex when you're talking about so many different cultures and perspectives and contexts and continents and perspectives on education, uh, and then some perspectives from, from so many different uh, folks around the globe. So let's get some context. How did this project kind of get started? Uh, how did yeah. it come to be? Lisa, why don't you right. kick us off here? Sure. As I said, it was kind of probably maybe three years ago, <laughs> I'm thinking in 2020, which seems so long ago. But I 
I've been very enriched by meeting people from around the world with some international work. And I was talking with my colleague because it was like during COVID and everyone was just trying to talk with each other and figure things out, right? And so I remember talking to Evelyn, she's a colleague in the Philippines and I met her in 2015 when I went over there um, for their conference and did a keynote. And she, it was interesting because she was asking me things that, I at, that really brought me some ideas of maybe we should know what's happening around our association work because she was saying to me, well, what's going on? Is Have people changed what they were doing in associations? Because she was a key leader in her association and I didn't have the answers. I wasn't absolutely positive on what she, on what she was asking on how um, associations were operating differently during COVID or how that might've changed. So she started saying, well, why don't we look at writing something? And she was the first one that thought about it. And then also, Birgit, I don't know if you remember, but your book came out with Roger and you had a, you had an, um, you had a chapter in there about professionalization and student affairs. So Evelyn and I were talking about that too, is are we a profession? <laughs> are we not? That's always seems to be a conversation that we talk about um, when we get together internationally. So I picked up the phone after talking with Evelyn and well, maybe I emailed you, Birgit, I can't remember, and asked Birgit what she thought um, of this. And I didn't really know where we should reach out to to see if we did get everyone together. And I don't remember, Birgit, how did we think of new directions? I don't remember how we chose that, or maybe it was Evelyn, I can't even remember, but we thought of writing a proposal to new directions for student services, because we really thought too, is after all the work with IASIS in seven years, Birgit and I really had a lot of contacts that we could use um, in looking at how our field is professionalizing. Are we a, are we, um, a pro professionalized, mm -hmm. uh, are we working towards it? And how is it happening in the different regions, the grassroots? So that's really what I remember as a starting point. What about you, Birgit? Um, in fact, I just can add something to how we got to think about it being a book, because I think we might have started thinking about an article saying, well, let, why don't we think about just mm -hmm. professionalization across the globe? And then given your trajectory and your walk across the globe and mine, where I've come from and the route I've taken is really quite different. And we've been in different systems and different yeah. systems of higher education, and they have a different need of student affairs and they've got different practices for professionalization and different associations in fact you know, the world yeah. is really a, a very textured place and I think we couldn't pack it into an article and that's <laughs> probably when we thought well you know this might need to be a larger project um, right. and then and then you know to make it authentic you use the voices in the field and I think that's what the second part we'll talk about that in a minute but yeah. I think getting all the other authors in was about trying to get authentic voices from right across the globe to um, speak to their experience and their context. Yes. And I remember it was really quick, um, Keith. We had to, I remember that I think we had, the proposal was due in January, Birgit. And so we wrote it in December relatively quickly, but we wrote everyone and said, hey, if if we get this through, will you be part of it? And we had people emailing us back really quickly, which was so rewarding. Mm. in so many ways yeah, that they were interested. Yeah. Mm. I'm sure you're the only book proposal that got submitted within a month of being due. That's probably never happened before. No, no, no. <laughs> I think that's probably, probably most of them happen a little bit a week after the due date. Uh, well, the, as you mentioned, the, the, the book is kind of in three parts. Uh, and the first one really talks about and makes the case for and sort of unpacks this movement toward professionalization. Um, which I found really interesting. Um, we certainly have done that here in the U.S., but it's a little mind-boggling to get your head around doing that in so many different different governments, different mm -hmm. contexts, different cultures, yeah. different continents, different languages. Uh, so help us understand a little bit about this movement toward professionalization globally. 
So it's, mm. it's good you asked that because I think that the, there are at least two layers. I mean, there are many layers to this, but there are at least two layers. One is what is specifically going on in the contexts across the world. So the Central European, the Western European space is really being social welfare state is very, very different to let's say um you know central Af southern africa or even you know up in asia across in asia and so forth and of course back in um in north america so the models are very very different so mm -hmm. there's something about what is unique about the space what is unique about the high education models and systems that are employed and they are in play that are there um so it looks specifically at what is specifically required in the context that the universities and the students are in. But there's something generic about it. And I think what's happening across the globe, there is a generic movement towards massification, towards diversification. Universities are trying to find niche areas. So it's a stratification of universities. Um, there is a massive push towards marketization. So universities market and they, um, they, they market for the best students. They try to attract the best students. And they do that largely. Um, in many ways, of course, but student affairs is implicated. And by doing, by implicating student affairs and including it, we there is some pressure to professionalize. So I think that there's something generic across the globe in terms of kind of these massive movements towards marketization and, um, you know, global higher education, it's globalizing. But then there's something quite unique in the specific contexts. Mm -hmm. You're really reminding mm -hmm. me of qualitative research, right? Where we see, we talk with folks and we hear so many different divergent stories from so many different people and unique life experiences. And then you look at all of that and say, oh, and there is a common story, a common thread that these folks share. And you're seeing some of those dynamics and the both and of it is so diverse, it is so different, it is so complex. And there are some themes that you see across all of these different contexts. That's really cool. Yeah. Lisa, what are, what are you seeing in this movement towards professionalization? Well, I think Birgit, I agree with everything she said, but there's also the internationalization piece mm -hmm. that is big. Our students are coming from many um, of us um, in different parts of the world have many international students. Mm -hmm. Um, and we need to understand the systems. We need to be aware of what's happening. And I think that this book, you'll see in there too, it is working towards professionalization, but also internationalization of our work as student affairs professionals. And I think that is pretty key to, I think, some threads that we've seen throughout the um, different parts of the book is how important internationalization is to our professional um, work we do. Understand globally what's happening, but then see how we can use that context globally to our local reality. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious yeah. to hear from both of you a little bit about what you see as the assets of professionalization. And and are there any worries that you have mm. about that? Mm -hmm. I was about to interrupt you and say, yes. well, let's, let's talk about, I'm always the one that sees the underbelly and the worrying yeah. bits. And I'm usually the one that says, oh, let's be careful here and be cautious there. And so, um, Oh, should we start with the positive first? Or yeah, should we leave what are some assets? <laughs> we'll get into that. Yeah. So, so the positive, of course, is that it becomes a profession that identifies with a common theme and that can um, advance its own practices, become better at its own job, understand why it does certain things, can collect data and develop a scholarship around student affairs. So we simply get better at understanding what we do um, and how we do it and why we do it. So I think that is what professionalization is largely about, becoming better at understanding oneself and becoming better at doing it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and in the process, of course, we accelerate student success and institutional success. Yeah. We build better contexts in which students work and learn and live. And so um, we get better at what we do in, in the broadest sense. So professionalizing um, helps with that. No. Yeah, and I'm also wondering about that's that's great about the scholarship and research and and sharing good practices that are effective here with more people, so more people can benefit. I'm also wondering about um, standards of practice, ethical codes, uh, what is okay and what is not okay. Sharing some of those kinds of things. Is there more to this? Well, I mean, I think we figured. I don't know, if, but we talk a little bit about that too is thinking about how we take knowledge from global north to the global south mm -hmm. 
and making sure that um, we're careful, we think about it more, we just don't apply it with a, a lens without any context or any um, voices. That's mm -hmm. the thing that's big is mm -hmm. voices from that context. Is this going to work and so forth? I saw that even with my own work going from America to United Arab Emirates. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an important piece um, that we have to think about as that happens, because Global North does have the largest voice in research, in um, pro professional associations. And we were very clear in what we wanted to do is make sure there was this that we were elevating the voices equally. And even to the point, Keith, if you remember, Birgit, we talked about, okay, we wanna make sure we only have so many words for each <laughs> for each region. I know it sounds a little crazy, Keith, but we yeah. wanted to keep that in mind, yeah. keep the level playing field. So if there were four associations, you know, okay, in this group, well, maybe the four associations, that should be the same amount of words. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm babbling on now. But I think that's something we have to think about. Another critique, if you don't mind me just going on real sure. quickly that I think about all the time, and we talked about this too, is, okay, so what about this, the, um, we see in North America and some other places where there's all these specialist mm -hmm. organizations and associations. Mm -hmm. And so we're getting so specialized. What is that doing to the field and how, and what is that doing to those that want to be part of the field and want to grow and learn? Are, are we doing are we maybe hurting ourselves, not getting enough um, different voices, um, social justice aspects? I know there was something about that too that I read about, like competencies and doing the credentialing and doing the certificate programs. Does that leave people out? Possibly that can't be part of, um, you know, growing and developing in the field so they could do their work better. Mm -hmm. So I love what you say about remembering the global north, global south um, tension that is there. Um, so what we do need to be very careful of is that we don't export global mm. north models and knowledge sets into areas that still need to find their voice. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, in fact, of course, also up to the global south to develop its own language, develop its own programs, develop its own ideas and models and so forth. Um, and that needs to happen. A lot of that needs to happen. And by professionalizing, I think one can be quite clear on where do we professionalize with, with which model. It becomes explicit. So I mm -hmm. think that that's what's nice about it. There is exactly that. We can defend it in a sense against the fear of saying, well, now we're just exporting a, you know, the, the American model of professionalizing um, to, let's say, um, the global South or South America or South Africa or Southern Africa and so forth. So I think... The, the act of professionalizing or the process makes us enables us to be clear about what we do and then we can defend against it or acknowledge it and do it so i think that's why i like it um the the what i wanted to add here was that um by professionalizing we do we do end up sort of kind of circums uh, uh, describing the skills very specifically lisa that's what you were mentioning now and mm -hmm. it becomes, um, you know, it's remi it, it, I'm reminded when we do this micro credentialing and, you know, we credential one little tiny skill in isolation of kind of not having a context. So there is a risk that when we professionalize, that we narrow down the fields and we define things so narrowly and so specifically that then excludes or that diminishes the context and that diminishes the sense of kind of like, where is this profession located? Where does it belong? How does it define itself? How does it, from a discipline point of view, kind of where does it live? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And the other, sorry, the other quick risk um, about having professional student affairs in institutions might be that they become the the um, the guardians of all things caring or all things student success or all things student engagement. When in fact, of course, it's everybody's business to engage with students, to care for students, to be clear about processes and to be transparent and so forth. So as long as these processes that are good for students and good for student success are not just located in student affairs, but are um, generalized across the institution, um, yeah, so so that is just one of the few things yeah. to worry about when we say there's a professional student affairs practitioner on, on our style. I love the point you were making about um, the process of professionalization being explicit 
So we can say, this is what we're doing. These are the models we're recommending. Is that the global north being imposed or not? Because if you just avoid that, it can still happen. It's just, exactly. it, you know, exactly. not explicit, not transparent, no accountability. It just sort of happens. And so I, I'm reminded of, you know, being, let's be explicit about our curriculum. And uh, if you're not explicit about it, it's not that you don't have a curriculum. It's just a hidden curriculum that you, <laughs> your exactly. students can't hold you accountable. Your colleagues can't hold you accountable. So that transparency of the process mm -hmm. uh, with Lisa's comments about let's offer what has been learned through scholarship and practice and 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 decades of work, but let's offer it lightly. Is would right. this be helpful in your context? Would it not? And let's offer that as a resource, but let those um, familiar with the context and their own voices determine what they take on or what they adapt. The other thing that's really standing out to me is, I feel like both of you are pointing to a lot of the things in the U.S. higher education and student affairs realm that. Um, Many see it as advancements. And then you're saying, mm, maybe, <laughs> I'm not so sure. What are some things that we have learned that maybe we need to unlearn? Um, and, and not just uh, cross cultures, but just maybe that's not a great idea. Yeah. Maybe we need to think about some of this. And so the ability to question what is happening, um, I think is really, really useful. Right. But if I can just add something here, which is really um, interesting how we have already speaking, and I think we're so familiar with the, with the uh, US model around student affairs, um, that some of that, of course, so when I think, for instance, about Central and Western Europe, um, they're very, the countries, well, be that Germany or France or Spain or Italy, are very strong social welfare states. So a lot of the caring is done by the state. So the mm -hmm. universities don't really look after disability or they don't really um, worry about bursaries or worry about residences because universities would say, well, we teach mm -hmm. the caring for accommodation and food and disability and social justice and street law and those kinds of things is done by the state. We don't do that as a university. And so in many ways, the less student affairs we have in universities, the more the state takes on caring mm -hmm and caring for everyone, be that children or adults or aged or whatever, or students. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they, so in many ways, we want to, in fact, work towards a space where the state becomes a social welfare state, where state is a caring state, rather than universities being, being burdened, not burdened, but being, you know, taking on the role of caretaker of students, mm -hmm. when in fact, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I just what, want to say that there are different spaces that really understand student affairs quite differently and different places take responsibility for it. No. Yeah. And it's great to hear that that's, uh, we need to think about that in the greater context, not just higher yeah. education, but what's the context there. Right. Um, you really brought in the perspectives of many voices, as you said, Yeah. word count and really tending to lots of different <laughs> things. I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, how you made some of these connections because it, it's sure. it's remarkable to see the people and places and roles uh, and context that people are offering and what they shared. So I'd love to hear how that came to be. I'd also love to hear what did you learn from those contributions? What what yeah. sort of richness did they offer? Sure. Well, the International Association of Student Affairs and Student Services, which now in its ten years, was really the impetus to bring some of these voices together. That's how I met Birgit. She, I just emailed her virtually to, we needed the regional director. She was on our database. I think I emailed her and she took it. So yeah. anyway, she got voted in. But what I'm trying to say is that's how we started talking with each other. So the cool thing I think about this um, part two is that we created teams of authors and we actually did Zoom calls with them mm -hmm. separately, trying to get a feel of what are those themes that are coming that they want to make sure we cover in each of the regions and so forth. So I think um, that was also, we were able to solidify the leaders and ask them, is there someone missing here? Mm -hmm. Is there association missing here mm -hmm. that we really should be key to? And so I think that was one way we did it um, that I think was pretty successful. Uh, related to learning, my gosh, there's so much. I, I have to tell you one thing that just encourages me is just the passionate leaders and the field and these people that take their time out from their role at a university to want to better themselves, better others, to create um, 
improvement in their work for students, for their universities, and for their communities. So I think that's one key thing that came out. I think also thing that came out that we just discussed a little critique that there were some regions that the voice was from the more of the global north. And I think um, and some of that is because the higher education models are possibly like in the Middle East are um, uh, a lot of North American, but we still need to find those local voices somewhere. So maybe there's another way to get those local voices um, in the conversation, you know, because it's okay to have a couple associations, maybe a grassroots, maybe the North American, maybe the UK, whatever. But I think that is something that I think I took away. And lastly, and this goes back to our conversation, it's okay for us in the global North to want to share what we do. But I think better yet is to help others do research so there's locally relevant mm -hmm. inform information so they can get the context of their students, so they can develop programs that matter to the students in that area. So I would say that throughout all of the regional reports, everyone mentioned research, mm -hmm. specifically, um, maybe not not as much in the North America context, mm -hmm. but I think mm -hmm. that's something I saw. And, oh, sorry, I forgot the social justice lens. Maybe you could talk about that, Birgit. That came out too in the regional reports, um, just that we all share um, the essence of wanting to, there might be different things we're working on related to justice issues, but we are concerned about that and want our students to be successful and graduate and have the skills necessary to compete, to compete mm -hmm. and be good citizens. So I just wanted to add something about, um, Keith, when you asked, how did we get all these authors? In fact, we had to turn so many people down. Mm. So the network, um, so luckily, to some extent, Lisa and I are involved in various networks. I'm involved in the, Scar in the Star Scholars Network, in IASIS, which has got, you know, 1,700 members across the globe, um, and, and really kind of, you know, across the globe. So it's really... And the Global North is really a small part of that. And we really um, are spread very well across the globe. And so it was actually quite easy to invite people. We put a call out and people came forward saying, you know, I want to be part of it. Um, in the end, I think we had, a, is it 25 authors, Lisa? No, I can't even it's remember. It's more. I think so. I think it's, yeah. No, I think, I think, I think so. Mm. Yeah, I think 25, <laughs> five, ten. Yeah, maybe, thir maybe 30. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> No, it was a lot. And and in fact, how we started also is we, we workshopped the book. We said, well, if we want this book to happen, right. how do we cluster things? How do we do this? And so yeah. we came up with this idea of having first three in part one, sort of the, the general sort of descriptive approach of what goes on in the world, what are the issues, what are the global issues, and how do we map competencies and map standards and so forth. And then we go into the regions. And at the end, we do some critiques, some um, reflections on where might we go? What are the worries and what we need to watch out for? So mm -hmm. I mean, it's quite easy to attract people, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. What did you learn from all these different perspectives and things that folks offered, Birgit? Um, mm -hmm. What I learned, um, which I haven't mastered at all, is to be more quiet and listen more. <laughs> um, and I think that that's something <laughs> I'm so bad at that because I love teaching and I love sharing ideas and um, and I get very excited and so I do talk um, a lot, but part of what I think needs to happen is that the global South needs to find its own voice, needs to really, yeah, really exactly. publish and research and, and, and they need platforms. We need platforms in mm -hmm. which we can share that knowledge. Um, and for that to happen, um, others need to listen, you know, mm -hmm. and I think yeah. that that sometimes is, is a, is a, is a very hard balance to get right. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. So well, yeah. today today we're glad you're sharing and talking. So thank you for for doing yeah. that. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'd love to hear from from you both about um you know you, you you're both immersed in this for decades. You're involved in associations. You edited this book and heard from so many different authors and contributors and thinkers. And of course now you've shared it and you're talking about it. I'd love to hear from both of you what you see in the future. For student affairs and student services globally, what what do you what do you see coming ahead? 
Um, and, and, you know, that, that's a, a question that I would have answered differently even two years ago when we started mm -hmm. the book. Um, when two well, years ago, changed just, about 10 years in exactly. the past two years. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Exactly. Yeah. So oh. what is so, in fact, what I think is going to change tremendously is the influence of AI on student mm -hmm. affairs and how we um, do and how we um, support our students and help them develop towards um, socially conscious and socially just citizens of the world. So I think AI is going to play a much bigger role over the years to come. Um, and I think the other thing um, that's going to influence the discipline of or our scholarly thinking about student affairs is we're going to become much, much more transdisciplinary. It's going to be... Yes. Um, we are. So I think at the moment we, we kind of rely a lot on the on the North American sort of model, um, and there's there's a strong, beautiful, rich, um, you know, scholarship around student affairs. Um, but I think it's time that other spaces find their voice, and they will do that. And 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 I think that that'll they will emerge and they will assert themselves. Um, um, yeah. And I think that that'll that'll we'll see more of that now mm -hmm. i think that goes into birgit the third what would we call it the third profession the third oh my gosh third i just third, yeah. pardon so the so you, i think you're referring to the third space is cecilia yeah, Richards. The third, yeah sorry yeah. i just drew a blank. yeah the third space mm -hmm. i think that's a very interesting concept that came out um, through talking with our authors and thinking about the critiques of what we're going to do for part three. And I think that's very interesting. I think that's going to grow this idea. And I've seen it too in my in senior leadership that um, not just what we say our student affairs professionals are doing the work. We're working all together. Mm -hmm. There is different domains, faculty taking on some roles. Um, but again, this idea that students sometimes there's student unions in different parts of the world and they have a voice and they they and they hire for the professionals so i mean there's different ways that we have to think about how the work is and i think that's going to grow and that's why i think too the specialization could be an issue because i think we need to be generalists and work across mm -hmm. the areas and use the different skill sets, use faculty that are psych um, in the psychology department, English department for things you're doing. So I think that's important to support students. So I don't know, that came up to me as something I think will grow mm -hmm. as we move further. Yeah. Help me understand a little bit about third spaces. I sort of think about that as yeah. social spaces or things like that, but how, how are you using that in this context? So, so um, I think Homi Baba and Celia yeah. Whitchurch spoke a lot about that third space as being the intersection between the sort of more formal spaces. So you've got the kind of leadership and management and academics, and they meet somewhat. And there's an intersection between be that in, in that space are student affairs professionals, the librarians, the knowledge management, the yeah. Um, you know, people who deal with search stream funding, with um, sponsorship, marketing, um, residences. So it's, it's that space in the middle. And that space is going to grow enormously as universities right. become market ready or they want to be competing. Um, there's a much higher sort of chance of being litigious by uh, parents and so forth. So mm -hmm. that space in the middle is going to grow enormously. And that space is characterized by hybridity, by ambivalence. It's an intersection of various disciplines. And people in this space needs, need to be very, um, very agile to quickly work at a very high level, but quickly also work um, at, at different levels. So it's not just horizontally, but also cross vertically. Um, so there is a high kind of pressure for performance and it's and, and yet it's in quite an individual um invisible space yeah. so that's what this third yeah. space is about and i know it comes from sociology and from space from mm -hmm. ideas of spaces yeah. um yeah. but it, it, it's a nice term to describe this intersection here mm -hmm. yeah i i love it I, i've never heard that to talk about sort of the i'm hearing sort of the student affairs space sort of broadly defined and we might even think about athletics we might think about oh, exactly. dining halls we might think about just sort of the informal uh, learning spaces. And I love some of the language you, about agile and both super sophisticated, right? Navigating students' complex mental health issues, but then yes. also putting the chairs away and cleaning up the tables exactly. after an event, right? Yeah. And the both and, and yeah. of that. Exactly. Right. And I would say too, like crossing, um, you know, crossing units more like sustainability. We just had the conference on panelists, COP28 in Dubai, and we were working with sustainability faculty research on creating 
um, climate literacy. So, I mean, all those things are coming together. So I think that's going to happen more. And I do agree with Birgit. I think it's going to grow. Yeah. I mean, just as an example, Lisa, this is a lovely example that you're bringing now about sustainable development. So the universities are more yeah. and more going to report on their impact on the SDGs. Um, right. and what are the SDGs again, for people who aren't familiar? Sustainable, sustainable development goals. Yeah, but we both know it very well. We yeah, the, United, the United Nations, you know, have, have put out, well, we, the United Nations, just simply facilitated all the nations right. um, coming together and formulating the SDGs that are that are um, sort of premised on the Millennium Development Goals. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got Agenda 2030. People are going to be familiar with these terms, but it really just means universities need to report on how they contribute towards sustainable development. And mm -hmm. again, it is people in this third space that are going to generate these reports, that are going to monitor our, our curricula really delivering towards sustainable development. Are we environmentally um, sustainable? And do we have a curricula that are um, that are aligned to these goals? Mm -hmm. And again, it's people in the third space that monitor this and that mm -hmm. report on it and, and perhaps mm -hmm. do it. You know. mm -hmm. I agree. What else do you see here as you look to the future or maybe what calls would you want to offer for folks who um, chose to listen to this episode or watch this episode who are really interested? Um, I'm wondering about folks who um, are around the globe wanting to learn. Right. Um, I'm also right. thinking about folks who are in the U.S. who maybe are thinking about uh, moving beyond the U.S. and, and looking yes. at higher <laughs> education in other places who are maybe curious about that. What would you want to offer folks? Lisa, so, you know, the one thing I'm thinking, of course, I want you to think, refer yeah. them to the website, uh, the, to the IASA's website, which, of course, has yeah. a huge list, a wonderful list of global books, but again, books that are written by a set of authors from across the globe that use references from across, yeah. across the globe and that use data and evidence from across the globe. So those are kind of really, um, they, 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 yeah, it's more than just writing about internationalization or, yeah, so it, it's really um, attracting international, a bunch of mixed people and that kind of nice books come out of that. And so the website is full of that. That's the one yeah. thing. The second thing, if ever, you know, if somebody is listening, um, I would give advice and say, if you want to professionalize and advance your um, your professional identity and your professional standing, start doing international courses. They are amazing courses that are outside of um, our familiar spaces, outside of the UK, outside of the US, outside of, you know, those sorts of be well trodden and be well equipped and well established spaces. Those are great spaces. But I think pick something that is beyond, that is new, that is fresh, um, that gives you a, a lens and experience that perhaps you don't have at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess I will speak to maybe those that we still haven't heard from, Keith, mm -hmm. at Birgit, right? You and I talk about, we say that there's some others out there too that maybe we haven't reached that are doing some great things too. And we know it ke it's keeps happening. We know that now recently, we know even before the book, I mean, when the book maybe it was during it or at the end, found out there's a Kenyan Dean of Students Association mm -hmm. that we didn't talk with, we didn't get a chance. So I wanna say to those that are creating um, opportunities for professional development, um, practices together, exchanges, that to look at our book, to look at some different models and, and think about how they wanna create their space and um, the learning for um, the betterment of students th themselves and um the communities mm -hmm. wonderful wonderful well we we're running out of time and uh the podcast is student affairs now so i always like to end with this question is what are you thinking troubling or pondering now it might be related to our conversation might be related to other things uh so love to hear from each of you about what's on your mind now and then also if folks want to connect with you where might they be able to do that go ahead lisa Gosh, um, what am I pondering? I said a lot already. Yeah. I I think I'm still pondering this idea of research locally and how even with IASIS, I struggle like the International Association um, is, is how can we create 
opportunities or enhance opportunities for research and provide spaces or journals or things that, and not journals in the sense of Scopus One, or but like how could we create opportunities for um, for people to write mm -hmm. and to maybe write comparatively and so forth. Um, so that is on my mind and 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 then I guess just continually being careful. The reason why I want to elevate the voices that are maybe not thought of even in my first years of my time as a professional working in North America, I never thought of globally, but I, I want to make sure those voices are heard mm -hmm. um, and elevated because I think ultimately it makes our practice stronger globally if we're all mm -hmm. at the right. table. Right, yeah, benefits all of us, great. Yes. So Keith, maybe I can just add a quick last thought. I know time is running. Um, I would like us also to remember that all the good work we do is no good if our contexts are not uh, conducive towards good student um, engagement and student living and learning. So while we work at our universities and we try and prove our spaces in the universities, we must remember our students are contextualized, they live in context, they live embedded lives together with their families, with their homes, with their and together with all the social ills that often that they need to live with. And we must remember that. And that makes us social activists. It makes us um, activists towards creating a world and a context for our students in which they can, you know, really engage and be um, authentically part of focusing on their studies. So I want us just to remember also about uh, the context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Keith, I think they can learn more from Birgit and I both are, I know I got Birgit on LinkedIn more. So <laughs> I think we're both on LinkedIn space. Um, but again, we've done some things around the sustainability development goals that we'd love to share with others, because I think that ties more into thinking about the global practice of student affairs as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, and what, and Birgit's talking about our communities. Right. Well, we'll get some some of those links in the, the resources on your episode page. Um, and we'll get places where folks can contact you there. I really appreciate you both uh, in this conversation. It has me really reflecting on how to elevate uh, and, and give platforms to voices that, that aren't getting them. And also, uh, it has me thinking a lot about, in the U.S. context, what we need to unlearn. Uh, what things have we sort of advanced that we need to question or think differently about. Um, mm. And really sharing resources is not always a good thing, right? So how do we share consciously an offer, but um, uh, but also think about the context and let folks who are in that context uh, have the ownership and the agency around all of that. I uh, like that. <laughs> it's been terrific. Thanks to you both. Uh, and thanks to our sponsors of today's episode, Leadership and Rutledge. Leadership partners with colleges and universities to create transformational leadership experiences for students and professionals with a focus on creating a more just, caring, and thriving world relevant today. Leadership offers engaging learning experiences on courageous dialogue, integrity, equity, resilience, and community building. To find more, please visit leadership.org to connect with them or you can find them on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And Rutledge and Taylor and Francis is the world's leading academic publisher in education, publishing a wide range of books, journals, and other resources for practitioners, faculty, administrators, and researchers. They have welcomed Stylus Publishing to their publishing program and are thrilled to enrich their offerings in higher education, teaching, student affairs, professional development, assessment, and more. Rutledge is proud to sponsor Student Affairs Now. View their complete catalog of authoritative educational titles at rutledge.com slash education. And as always, huge shout out to our producer, Natalie Ambrosi, who makes all of us look and sound good with all of her work behind the scenes. And we love the support for these important conversations from our community. You, you can help us reach even more folks by subscribing subscribe to the podcast, to YouTube, and our weekly newsletter so you get the latest on each new episode. If you're so inclined, you can leave us a five-star review. It also really helps us reach more folks with this free, great content. I'm Keith Edwards. Thanks again to the fabulous guests today and to everyone who is watching and listening. Please make it a great week.